when I was born. Um, and this is a memory of from pictures only. Of course, um, my parents were live. We were living in a very nice location, home in Eindhoven, um, and you know they. My being their first child, they really, you know, took care of me and so on and so forth. And this memory comes from pictures. She took it upon herself, I guess, to take her daughter and walk the streets with the Jewish star she had to wear, the Jewish star. And whoever took the picture and whoever gave it to either my mother or my father, I don't know that. I never got an answer for that. So to me, in later years, I am identifying it all to being luck, not being picked up at that time. Would have been picked up and sent you know where. Um, so that was the beginning of the luck. My memory doesn't really start until I'm four and a half living with this family in hiding. Prior to that, I don't have actual memories of, um, except when I look at the pictures. And that always makes me think, how and how did the pictures survive? when everybody, when my parents and myself were in hiding. So I never asked. And um, the older you get, you want to ask more questions, which doesn't work anymore. And my parents are walking away and I'm crying. So I remember that part being told they'll be back and they'll be back. So that's how my memory is starting with my parents dropping me off with this family, nice, nice Dutch people. They had no children. And um, actually I called them my tante. The last name was Wouter. R-U-I-T-E-R. -E so, Tante Wouter, actually she was German and married this Dutch man, which was Oma Jaap, very Dutch name. And they were very, very nice with me and to me and treated me very nice. I learned that I was supposed to be my tante's niece, because where did I come from? Um, I was always told I couldn't go outside. Uh, there were no children involved, except next door. And this was a nice house that they had. They ran a, uh, well, like a boarding house. The people that were working for the Phillips Company, which is still there, and um, but they they had room and and eating there, you know, dinners and so on. And I was the niece, and everything went well. Next door, there was a neighbor, and a lot of people at that time started to have. Um, what do you call it? Shelters built into the ground and shelters. And that developed because of that, then you had like a big little mountain on top. And the neighbors had two children, a boy and a girl, kind of my age. And in the beginning, my tante let me play with them until the boy, the older boy, 
he was the oldest, he decided to ask me some questions. Paula was the Dutch name for Paula. And um, how come your hair is dark? How come your eyes are not blue? Those children had blonde hair, the Dutch children. And I had no answer to that question. So when I went back to Tante to the house, I told her, she says, you can't play with them anymore. So that was the time that that was the end in that way. Now, with her running the, them running the boarding house, um, they had a girl, a cleaning girl, maybe 17 or 18. And she kind of took me under her wing too. And my tante made her or asked her to take me to the Catholic Church, become involved in the church and, you know, have nothing to do with what I was supposed to be. So I became Catholic. I got a rosary and I did what you do when you go to the Catholic Church. There's always a water thing there that you have to put your hands in and then do your that and the rosary. And I thought that was nice. I, I liked it. You know, that's all I knew. I don't know if the sisters in the church knew anything about me. I did have a communion. Apparently, I got a pink dress that I remember. Uh, and... This gal, and I don't remember her name at all, but she took me and she had a bike and that's how she took me on a seat at the bike, on the bike in the back. And um, and that part I remember. So that became my life. Um, we had, when it became when the bombs started, the plane started to come over, with the bombs, that people with the two children on the other side of the house, they would not let us go into their bomb shelter. But two doors down, there was another one that had it, and somehow they let us in. And we had to be in there quite often with the bombs, the planes coming over. And I took my rosary and I prayed to God, to Jesus, you know, that they wouldn't hit us. And it didn't hit us. It did hit the house next door. But it didn't hit us at that time at the bomb, at the shelter or our actual house. So that was fortunate that, hey, Paula, you did good. You know, that's my life. I had no children. Normally what you are when you're four and a half, five years old. Now I'm five. And I had no childhood at all at that time. I never went to it. There was no kindergarten or anything for me. All I had was a buggy for, with a doll. That's all I remember. The sleeping part, sometimes I know when there were other people coming into the house that did not know anything about me, I kind of had to go into a, a basement so I, they wouldn't see me and not to talk or cry or anything. I was always taught to listen to my tante and my omiyap and do what they tell me to do. Living with my tante and omiyap, and they had a big house, enough bedrooms and rooms for these people that, that they were housing there. You had to take in, once the Germans took over, an SS officer had to go now and live in your house so that he would have a nice place and get food and the Dutch people had to cater to him. So here I am, supposed to be her niece and this Nazi officer now comes in and he's making nice to me. 
I'm sitting on his lap. He was a short guy, kind of blonde hair, short guy. I don't seem to talk too much to him. If I remember, my aunt would tell me, you know, don't say much. Don't say anything. You are, I am your aunt and your parents are, I don't remember what I'm supposed to say where my parents are because I didn't understand any of this at all. Uh, why I'm even there to begin with. And anyway, um, so he is there, not every day, but uh, just thinking about it afterwards, you know, how, how this could have gone wrong, very wrong for me and my parents who are hiding somewhere else. And it could have gone bad for my Tante and my Omiyap, because what they're doing, the, uh, the, the Dutch, uh, the Germans, you know, hold them just as responsible, even though they are not Jewish, but having anything to do to save a Jewish life, they can be sent to camps just like the Jews on the trains. Finding this all out afterwards um, is for me so emotional to have happened. And then again, luck for them and for me. Maybe even the other people that were living there also, you know, they might have known something, I don't know. But um, being such an innocent child, you go along with what you're being told. I was always told not to say anything, don't do this or don't do that. And, and, um, and I did. And that was always continuously my life, what not to do and behave and so on and so forth. I did not uh, wonder where my parents are, why am I here? I never asked. I was so well taken care of by my tante. And she kind of, they took care of me like their own child. And my Omiyap, he would go to, um, he had a area, a plot, in a, not by the house, but somewhere where he was growing vegetables. And a few times he did take me with him to do the, to go with him to there. And it just was like taking me like his child. I, that was my life. I didn't remember anything prior um, of my parents. Not that they really would, you know, hug you and 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 give you that feeling that I'm your mother, I'm your mom, I'm your I never had that feeling from my parents. So it was very easy for me to um move into that lifestyle. And who knows what would have happened other if things didn't go the way they did. So while I was living, hiding with Tante Bouter, know me up, uh, what kind of my daily routine was very basic. When my Tante and the cleaning lady and so on were in the kitchen, I was in the kitchen watching them and um, just what they were going, very simple meal because you couldn't get too much food. Um, and that's another thing, perhaps, I don't know, but having that Nazi live there, they might have been able to get more food of some sort, you know, maybe some kind of meat or whatever, I don't know. I do know talking about meat, oh my goodness, a memory just came in back. Oh me up. I don't know if he did it himself, hunting, 
he got a rabbit. Oh my goodness, we're going to have a rabbit. That was a big thing. So he got the rabbit and it's hanging in the little, um, in the backyard. It's not a garage, but it's just like a little work area. It's hanging there and he is skinning it. And I am seeing this rabbit naked while he's skinning the, 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 the skin off of that, you know, the, <clears throat> the what do you call it? The, the felt, whatever it was called. Yes, yeah, so that just all of a sudden came back to my mind because that is as clear as yesterday when I see something on TV when they're talking about rabbits and, and cooking rabbit. And I thought, oh, yes, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so um, what I also did was help this gal with the cleaning. And that kind of kept me busy during the day or it was time to maybe they were reading to me and then I'm sitting at the lap of this Nazi. Um, so, it's, but there is no life, no child life, you know. Is anybody reading me uh, Dutch um, children's stories? I don't know what they read me, I don't know. So the two and a half, three years of the wartime goes on and on. And finally, we're starting to hear, I guess, from radios that you're not supposed to have, but they did, that there's going to be the Americans or the English are going to be flying over very close to the town, Eindhoven, to start invading, you know, to... And the day that they knew that it was going to happen, the time of day, we all went upstairs to the attic and looked out the window and saw all the parachuting coming down, the planes and the parachutes coming down. And it was the happy, happy day that it looks like we're going to be and Eindhoven was freed earlier than the rest of Holland because of the location for them to go into Germany. So we were actually liberated in September of 1944, where the war ended in Holland, not until 1945. So this was a very happy, happy time. I remember being, that I remember very clearly. This Nazi now has to leave. And that's when I kind of became aware of why I was with these people, Tante Reuter and Omiyab. We both, she and I, are walking him to the front door, like a guest, you know, <laughs> saying goodbye. <clears throat> So my tante is standing to my right. <clears throat> I'm on the left. He's standing outside of the door, the front door. And he's saying his goodbye. He's probably speaking German to my tante. Then he looks at me. And that I remember like clearly. He points his finger right at me. And he says, in German, which my tante translated in Dutch. Now, Paula, you can go free. What does that mean? You know, so afterwards, I'm finding out, well, you are Jewish and the Germans were catching Jews and that's why you're here until your parents come back to pick you up. And then when just hearing all that, I think either this guy, you know, a Nazi of all people, um, either had a heart 
or he had a family of his own that he made me sit on his lap and not able to see his own family or children. Um, I wish I would have known his name in a way because to me, he was a mensch. And perhaps because my tante was German and he might have figured out who I am, what I am, and um, all these possibilities. So again, luck. To me, I, I just chalk it all up to luck that, you know, that my parents made it. They waited until actually Holland, all of Holland was liberated because it could turn around another direction. Um, the stories that I heard later on, much later of what happened to them. Um, but anyway, when they did come to get me, I think I had to go with them. I didn't want to go with them because I liked the way the people were. I was a human being. I was, I was a child and I got that care and that love, attention that I didn't remember prior having going into hiding. And um, as it turned out, and after. So um, my father, they were at different places, apparently. I didn't hear this story until we came to America. But they had to find different places. So one, the last place that they were in, one of the last places, um, somebody must have turned them in or made the people aware that they were hiding Jewish people. So they tried to climb out of the attic window and apparently there was a Dutch soldier, whatever he was, downstairs. But the houses, most of the houses in Holland were all um, connected. And <clears throat> not the house that I was in, but, but where they were. So they <clears throat> climbed out of the attic window, and now there is this soldier on the roof and he gets into a fight with my father because my father fought him back he told my mother when she climbed out the window run along the the houses until you see an open window and climb into that window that's all i heard from them but the uh soldier had they didn't have guns but they had the uh the billy clubs and he fought with my father. My father got hit on the nose. He had a scar. But my father won and was able to escape. And that's all I heard. So that's all I know about what they went through a little bit, a little bit. But it could have been worse that they could have been turned in and wound up in the, one of the trains. Um but my parents never talked about, my mother never, never talked. So now I'm with my parents and um, somehow they get, they find this place. I don't know if the underground helped them find a place to live. And that's that street, the Swa William the Swagger Strat. That's what it is. William the Swagger Strat is the place that we wound up living with some other other people. And um, but my parents never asked me anything. How was your life? What do you? What what happened? How tell talk to me? Never. 
So I'm living with them and doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Okay, now you have to go to school. So there was a school nearby. They had a lot of many schools close to housing um, areas. And um, so I'm going to the grade school and you make some little acquaintances of girls and so on. And they always looked at me or they talked about their childhood, which was a normal childhood with family, with kids and toys and all that. I never had that. And I just uh, went along with everything because I was told not to tell them what I am. So I just kind of got myself involved in the school, what we learned to do. And um, um, there was one thing, what Christmas is not like Christmas here. It's more like St. Nicholas which is in November. And St. Nicholas is that the children would put their shoes near their fireplace or something, and all of a sudden you would get candy in the shoes, this pure sugar heart type of candy. So then I tell my parents what these other kids are getting. Why am I not getting well, we don't celebrate that. Why not? Well, if they told me that I'm Jewish, what does that mean? You know, I don't know. Uh, my father used to take me to the temple in Holland, just me. And it was a temple where the women, Orthodox the women were said, but I was a child, so I could sit with him. Um, my mother never went. And so the, we weren't really raised religious. Right after the war, when we were able to get a place to live with my parents, then the uh, soldiers that liberated us, uh, when we found out they were Jewish, somehow they found us and they would be with us or we found out that we could invite them for dinner on Friday night for Shabbos. Um, so this one English soldier, I did not know anything about Shabbos. I never knew much about that till I came to the United States. Um, but this one soldier that came to visit with for dinner a few times and then maybe before he was had to go back to England afterwards, um, he would come for a visit. And um, he mailed me and he called himself Uncle Ben Burke and he mailed me in, in English a hakala. I had no idea what that was. Why? What is that? I don't remember my parents ever celebrating a Jewish holiday or using this. I wound up using it for my children. That's a good memory of those days. I first realized that I w yeah, that I was different, that the, maybe the Jewish religion meant something to me was after the war, the the Jewish um, in Eindhoven, they started a like a youth group for the for the Jewish children. And that's when I kind of realized I <laughs> I made a friend in the Jew, a Jewish girl named Frida. And we clicked when we would meet at this Jewish gathering. My father would drive me there and um, then we celebrated. We were celebrating Hanukkah. 
and uh, we um, made out of crepe paper the uh, the the uh, <laughs> the menorah, and um, we would dress up like that. And I thought, oh, okay, that's interesting, yeah. But you can't talk about that at regular school because the kids are not Jewish and they don't know anything about this. And I don't want to talk about why I'm different. It just, my parents never really took me in talking about being Jewish, what it meant, what it, it's all about. what. Um, so I was always different. I had to make my own lifestyle, more or less, and to fit in with people that were had a different religion. So that's been with me all my life, basically. And um, so we had this little youth group, and I would meet Frida, which we became friends. But she would invite me to her house. I never invited her to my house because my house was not comfortable. I didn't feel that my mother made it homey and friendly for friends of me because I she wasn't that involved with me either. Nineteen forty six came around, now we're having our own home and my mother gets pregnant. So now there comes a little child, a baby. And this baby, um, if I wanted to go and play outside that I could do with some kids that I, that lived around where I lived that I went to school with, oh, you have to take my brother with you. Little kid, he's, what, a year and a half, he's walk. I don't want to. I want to be with my friends, you know, because my mother, unfortunately, she, for her, I guess, she got pregnant again right after. So now there's another baby coming. And um, I was like a little babysitter. I was not recognized as a... Now, what, what am I? Nine years old when my brother is born. I had no nine-year-old child life. So when my friend Frida says, come to my house, I was happy to get out of my house and to go to her house. So we are now nine, ten years old, and we're playing like you would think today a five-year-old would play. We had, she had little... Um, little children's toys that you can cook with. So we learned to make applesauce. Her mother showed us how to make applesauce with her little pots and pans. I thought that was wonderful. Our place of living, we didn't have a house. We had like a, a house that <clears throat> the people would rent the upstairs. Now, the upstairs is consists of the water closet, which was the toilet. That's a separate with the chain where you pull the chain. Um... And then there were two rooms, like one was like a living room, and it must have come furnished because my parents never got their own place back, nothing back anymore. And then the bathroom with, with the bathtub became my mother's kitchen. They put a board on top of the bathtub the bathtub has a um, water heater right over there where you can have warm water. And there is a little bathroom sink. 
and that was our kitchen. There was no refrigerator. There was a two burner stove, little. And um, she had to use the, the cellar, the basement to use as a refrigerator. Now, the, um, the milk got delivered by on a daily basis on a, on a cart and they had the metal milk uh, containers and there was a big German shepherd underneath the cart to bark and if anybody would come and steal something. And so my mother had to, many times, she made a cottage cheese out of the milk because the milk was sour and she would hang it outside on the clothesline. Um, and of course her washing clothes was all done in when you take the board off to do to take a bath and there's there was no shower there was always a bath so that was her existence after the war of surviving her family with food and um well it wasn't the way it supposedly was beforehand so you know she fought all this and what i come to realize that my parents were really broken from the war and how they had to survive and make do, but there was no, no family uh, existence in my, on my view that you realize yourself once you have your own family and, and, your children, you know, there was no talking to to me um, as I'm getting older and so on and so forth. I do not know anything about life. I don't know anything about being really Jewish. Now, this little Jewish group and with Frida, their parents were pretty religious. So Frida would tell me a few things and so on, and it didn't make any sense to me. So, so many times, many years after, I always wondered, maybe I was adopted. Maybe I'm not my, my parent's child. <laughs> That's how I started to believe what I was like. My father, either I think prior to the war, he was a, a salesman, and he would go to little towns near us, like to like a, a farmer's market, and selling socks, hosiery and socks. Um, and that's what he did again after the war. So every day he had different little towns that we went to that are kind of on the map. And some Saturdays, he took me with him. And that was nice. I didn't have to be at home taking care of my brother and sister. And okay, so I got dealt with a little more adult-like, you know, and probably helping him out that if he needed a break for one way or another. I was there and I could hold forth the, his stand that he had to, um, and we went to another town and I got to eat a whatever lunch, either my mother packed a lunch or my father bought a sandwich of some sort. So that was kind of nice. But we really never talked much about anything, you know, Maybe he tried to do something and make me feel a little more like his daughter. According to I, I, one picture I have with my father before the war, there's a picture that somebody took of my father holding me in the backyard of the house that we were living in, you know, showing that I guess he cared, he loved. 
but I think it was so broken afterwards that they, between each other, they told each other, we're never going to talk about it. So they were harboring all their feelings, what they had, and they didn't have me for two and a half or three years. I was just now, all of a sudden they had a child who's older and they don't know how to deal with the 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 automatic parental love didn't come out. So they were broken. They were, in a sense, you know, we hear about second generation. In a way, I'm a first generation of the Holocaust, but I'm also the second generation. And the older I am getting, not knowing how much longer I'm going to be here, um, it hurts. So, so then we finally, with him working and so on, we found a better place. But the place was the the situation of the house was exactly as the first one. Living upstairs, my room was in the attic. Um, in the first house where we lived, right after the war, the German planes, the V, they had the V1 and the V2. The V2 was after the war, and the V2 came right over my room. The scariness was just unbelievable. And it just, you know, you grow up with these things, and you don't know anything different you don't know what your acquaintances or your little friends, what kind of life they have at home and so on and so forth. I knew what I had and that was it. And I didn't ask questions. I was just too confused. And, um, and my mother, they were just too, too busy with their lives. So I, when we moved the second time, which was very close to where I lived during the war with Tante Wouter, and um, it was on Adenstraat, 31 Adenstraat, Eindhoven. And I would visit her when I was able to walk, I mean, able to have some time. I would walk to her house, yes, their house. And I did that a lot. I would be, you know, across the, another world. And all we could do is write letters. There was no cell phones. There was no phone conversations. And of course, when I'm, when we came to America, I wrote, we wrote letters. And, um, and then Omiya passed away in, in the 60s, 1960s. She kind of passed away in the later 70s, yeah. You know, I said goodbye to them, but nothing talking about thanking them because I didn't know why I would thank them. That word never came up. There is a trailer there. Very nice. Okay, what is that? I've never seen anything like that before. All I know about trailers is gypsies used to live in trailers. And, um, okay, so there is room for my parents. And the trailer has, like, where they have the table and the seats, they fold down. So my brother and sister, who are now... Um, 1953, my brother is uh, six, I think, at that time when we got here, and my sister is four, and I am 15. Where's Paula going to sleep? Oh, no room for Paula. Very nice. Okay, I'm taking everything in, in um, 
slight or whatever, however you say that. I'm just going along with everything. And Claire, she now sees there's no room for me. So she makes room in her house, in their house. And now I am sleeping in their house. When we lived in Lancaster, there was no information about anything. I was, again, just living amongst people that had no... Those were Jewish people, but they were American Jewish people. And um, so my life was just continuing on that way. So... When I got married and dating my husband, I talked about my experience. He himself didn't really know that much. In America, a lot of people didn't know that I'm finding out even today. They didn't even realize what was going on. Um, so, but we didn't deal with it. My husband and I didn't talk about it anymore or anything. My husband is watching on TV a lot of these war movies. And I see all this German, this Hitler guy. I, I, I would tell him, I can't watch, so I'm walking out of the room. Um, and I didn't start talking about it until I'm in my 50s. I became aware of what has happened to my previous years when we, I joined this child survivor group in the Los Angeles area. Somehow, when we moved to the LA area, I don't know if it had to do with my name or something came across. There was an invitation for me to attend this you this group. Uh, it was oh about I don't know fifty sixty miles away for the so Bernie drove me and I wanted to go just to meet some other Jewish people. There's a lot of women people there. And we're all talking about our experiences. So, and I'm hearing a lot of people had the same experience as I did, in a sense. Not necessarily that deep, but in a sense. And I thought, oh my gosh. So now they want me to talk. And I had never talked about anything. It took me a long time even to want to go to this group. So I'm now in my 50s. And I think, okay, yes, I am from, you know, Antover in Holland, and I was hidden and so on. And so we kind of start to talk about everything. And now knowing more about the Germans and the Nazis and how I hated them, anything German. I didn't want to have anything to do with that. I didn't want to hear that language. I could not handle it. Um... I always, the TV would turn it, you know, and cuss him out when I saw him on TV talking about Hitler. And just because of him and because of them, this is my life. This is where I'm at and how it has hindered me. It has robbed me of my childhood and my livelihood. And um, it didn't, the only thing that saved me was marrying my husband when I met him. And he was an American. And he just made life normal for me. Um, he took care of me. He, he showed, you know, care. And, and I had somebody to hug and, and somebody that... But I never talked to my parents literally against them, to them. I never did. We used to go to the temple, mostly because the boys, 
bar mitzvah, and so on. When that was done, I have no need to go and have somebody and read from a book something. My God is in my heart. And to me, that's enough. I don't, and I think we kind of raised the kids that way because I'm not, my husband wasn't a religious man either. And uh, I've kind of raised my family that way in a sense. But, um, and I am content. I definitely identify as being a Jew. I don't use the word being a Jew. I am Jewish. Because being a Jew to me is being identified anti Semitic. Oh, there's a Jew. You know, that sticks with me and that's out there. So I don't know if that's something. You see, it's <laughs> saying everything like that here is kind of against what I usually, I don't say all these things to anybody else, of course, um, because um, when I'm talking to some of the people that I know here and acquaintances, I call them, and they talk about their childhood and, and so on. And uh, well, what about you, Paula? I said, well, I have a different childhood, totally different. If there's somebody brings up and says, oh, World War II was terrible, because we're all both basically the same age. And um, some of them think that it is it was very bad here in America. And then it, it, it gets to me, and I think, why am I just being too quiet? I said, you're very fortunate you lived here in America and not in Europe during the war. I don't know if they know what that means, but I didn't want to come out and say that. <laughs> So that's, I'm, I'm, I am guarded, very guarded. Yeah, and that's all because of what happened to me during the Holocaust, what happened to my parents, how they reacted. Um, they were happy I married a Jewish man. I just hope that if children are going to listen to this or watch this, that they would think about how life can change on a drop of a, a pin to realize that when, it's, when there's a person who is going to run your country and can be uh, determined to do what he wants to do against certain people, to stay away from that, to go the other direction, and be aware because it can change immediately and it doesn't take very much and there's no power. When you've lost the power of your country, 